Hello chess enthusiasts! This is International Master Vitaly Neymer from PowerfulChess.com Today I would like to show you one of my best games which illustrates the power of two bishops. This game I was playing black against a strong women grandmaster Anna Sharevich in 2016. White played d4 I played knight f6, pawn to c4, pawn to e6, and Anna played pawn to g3. So we are in the beginning of the Catalan defense, in which white fanchettos the white square bishop. Now here, the most common continuation for black is to play pawn to d5 in order to control the center. In that case white usually continues with bishop g2 sacrificing the c4 pawn in order to gain a stronger center. However I decided to take Anna out of preparation by playing a different move. Pawn to c5. The idea behind this move is simple. Just like in the Sicilian defense, black wants to exchange his side pawn for a central pawn of white and thus gaining some advantage. However, Anna chose the correct move pawn to d5. This is a good response for white, because white is gaining space in the center using his pawns. Now I had no choice but to take the pawn. And now black's most common reply is simply to play d6, followed by knight c3. And if black plays now a6 to play pawn to b5, White would just play pawn to a4. And in the future, it would be very difficult for black to play b5 and get some counter chances on the queen side. So I decided in this position that I will play more aggressively and take the risk by playing b5 immediately. Now it does create some weaknesses but I was pretty confident. So Anna played bishop to g2. Now there are some d6 threats, so now I have to play pawn to d6. Knight f3. And I decided to fanchat on my bishop as well by playing pawn to g6. It seemed to me that the bishop on e7 is slightly passive. So Anna castled. I played bishop to g7 and here white played pawn to e4. Very ambush ambitious move, setting a trap. If I take the pawn with the knight, then yes, correctly, this king and the knight are on the same file, which means that now white will just simply play rook e1, pinning the knight. I would probably have to defend with my pawn because developing with the bishop would probably not be good. We know that there is, when there is a pin then we need to add more pieces to attack the pinned piece and eventually I would lose the knight over here. So after f5 Black wants to castle, but now white can gain a tempo by playing bishop to g5. Attacking my queen and planning to play knight c3 or knight to d2, again attacking the e4 pawn. So this position was not uh, so good for me. But nice try. So instead of taking on e4, I just castled. 
Now the idea for back is pretty simple. Put the rook on e8. The knight goes probably to d7, maybe to e5, maybe to b6, and attack this e4 pawn while I have some space advantage on the queen side. So then I decided to play more aggressively and play the e5 immediately. Breaking in the center. Well, I had no choice but to take because if I would go back with the knight then white would simply play rook to e1 and this center is just too strong. So I took the pawn, knight takes on e5 and now white is starting to win the rook by playing pawn to d6. Unle unleashing the beast on g2. So I had to counter that with my own beast. And this is why I played bishop to b7. Now the question in this position is is this pawn on d5 is it good? Is it good for white? Is it the strength because it's in the center? Is it the passed pawn? Or is it a weakness, which is being attacked? Right now, we have three attackers and only two defenders. So right now, it's a weakness. Now, if black wouldn't have that white black square bishop, then this pawn would be much more dangerous. So here, White can play knight c3, defending the pawn. But on this case, Black would probably I would probably play pawn to b4, knight a4, bishop takes d5, knight takes c5, and now bishop takes c2, g2, king takes g2, and queen c7. Now black wants to keep the the queens on the board rather than exchanging them because of the position of the white king. I always tell my students if the king of the, if your opponent's king is exposed and weak, keep the queens on the board just in case some tricks might come up. Now If white would play d6, then it is not such a good idea to advance your pawns without any solid support of your pieces. And in this case, black would, could probably play just knight to e4. And next move, taking this pawn. And the bishop is attacking the knight. So then I chose the correct move, and she played knight to c6. The idea behind this move is that if I take with my knight, then the pawn takes. Now I have to move the bishop. And after, for example, bishop to h6, white can just play bishop to e3. And this pawn is just too dangerous. Now, if I would take with my bishop, then white takes, and this leaves this pawn on c6 is too dangerous as well as this knight is very underdeveloped so I chose just a simple queen to d7 white played knight c3 and now I decided to sac knight takes c6 d takes c6 bishop takes c6 queen takes d7 Bishop takes d7, Bishop takes e8, and Rook takes a8. Now in this position it almost looks like we are in the end game, because there are no queens on the board, but I would say that there are actually plenty of pieces on the board for some middle game. 
Now, if we look at the position, we can see that white has a rook versus bishop and a pawn. We usually learn that in such a case, white would be better off because he is up by one point. So this is 5 against 3 plus 1. However, in this position, there is another hidden power that black has. And this is the power of the two bishops. White continued the bishop to e3, which is a good developing move. Now, if I would play now rook to c8, just defense, that would give white time to play rook a to d8, a to d1, which will um, develop white's rook and will make black's life much harder. Now, instead, if black just pushes the c-pawn, now black can follow with the pawn to a3 and blocking on those pawns. So here, they will actually become a liability, which, may, which will need to be defended rather than a, an attacking asset. So in the game, I chose the best move. I played b4, immediately attacking the knight. Here white played, it's hard to see which move is better. There are two options. There is knight to d1 and knight to e2. In the game, Anna chose knight to e2. However, this was not the best choice. Knight to d1 was actually better, but it is very hard to see why. Because from here, it looks like the knight cannot go anywhere. And it's disrupting the connection between the rooks, which we know is very important in chess. Now, after knight to e2, again I play the strongest move, bishop to b5, pinning the knight. Rook f to e1. And now, in this position, I asked myself the question that I always tell my students to ask themselves. What is your worst piece and how can I improve it? Well, I noticed that my knight and my dark squ square bishops are not doing much. And ask myself, where do I want the knight to be? Because once I move it, even the bishop is going to be activated. And then I saw it. I want the knight to be on f3 or d3. And therefore I played the best move, knight to d7, getting the knight on e5, which will allow me to get there, defending the c5's pawn from the bishop, and opening up my bishop for attack. Well, it seems like white didn't really want to lose the b2 pawn, because if he does, then this C pawn gets very dangerous, so white played rook a to b1. I played knight to e5. Something to, to notice here is that after exchanging the white square bishop for white in the Fanchetto bishop, usually there are a lot of weaknesses on those squares and it's almost impossible to defend all of them. For example, if white plays king to g2, just knight to d3, and this pawn is lost. So, white decided to give back some material and hope for the best. White took on c5, knight of 3 check, King to g2, knight takes e1 check, and rook to e1. Now, 
In this position, again, I ask myself, what is my worst piece? Yes, this is the rook. So I have to get it into a striking position. Rook to e8. White played bishop to e3. That's the only way to defend without losing any material. And now I play the pawn to f5. I could also take on b2, but I was slightly reluctant of this option because of rook to b1 and after rook bishop to a3 it did not seem like the best spot for the bishop. However the computer says black is completely winning. So in the game I play this move f5 and the idea is that now if white plays to b3 black can play g5 with a strong idea, pawn to f4. And if pawn takes, pawn takes. And if the bishop will take, then the knight is hanging. On the other hand, if the knight takes, then well, if takes, then I I should take the knight first. Rook takes, and then I take on f4. So, for example, if white just makes a random move, pawn to f4, pawn takes, now bishop takes in an intermediate move, rook takes, and now the pawn takes, using the spin. So, in the game after f5, white played knight to f4. Now I took on b2 because now after rook to b1 I played bishop to c3 that looks like the uh, much better spot for the bishop than this spot now why took on a7 so far it looks like it's an equal material but now we are going to see the power of the two bishops how and exactly how they restrain this knight. So I started with my move pawn to g5, knight h3, bishop c6 check, king to f1, bishop e4, improving my bishops, putting them in the center, rook to d1, and now simply h6. The idea is to get this knight restricted which excellently illustrates the power of the two bishops against knight and a bishop. So white try to take out the knight, activate him from knight to g1, but now the position is just too bad. I played bishop c2, rook to d6, White is trying to get some control play. However, that weakens the first rank. So I played the rook to e1 check, king to g2, now g4. And again, restricting the knight. He has nowhere where else to go. Here White played h3. If white would have taken on h6, then bishop e4, f3, pawn takes, knight takes, rook e2 check, bishop f2, and bishop d4. Those bishops and rook are just too powerful. So I played h3, bishop e4 check, and king to h2. Now, it's almost impossible to move the knight because of their rook to h1 checkmate. So, I found a weakness to attack, the a2 pawn, and I played rook to a1. h takes g4, rook takes a2, 
rook d8 check king f7 rook d7 check now king e6 as we know it is the end game now so we want to activate the king it's an important piece a fighting piece in the in the end game rook to h7 f takes g4 rook takes h6 check king to d5 bishop e3 still an equal material but if you can see each one of my pieces is much better than whites and now it is time to make a new queen pawn to b3 rook to b6 and now I just played rook bishop to d4 if rook takes on b3 then bishop takes on e3 rook takes and rook takes on f2 mate so in this case white had to just exchange the bishop again threatening the mate so white had to play rook to f6 and now I just played king to e5 and white resigned due to if white moves some of the rook then I just push my pawn and make a new queen so what have we learned from this game number one don't be afraid to exchange sacrifice to get a position advantage such as the two bishop pair number two during the game figure out what is your worst piece and where do you want it to be and then move it toward that square that is planning number three use your pieces to restrict the opponent's pieces and number four activate your king in the end game it is a strong piece thank you very much for joining me today this is Vi international master Vitaly Neymar for more videos please visit powerfulchess.com